Hi, I'm Elisio White, here to talk about map files. I'm the author of O'Reilly's Making Embedded Systems. I'm the host of the Embedded Podcast, and I have been an embedded software engineer for a couple of decades. For me, one of the great parts of making embedded systems is the thrill of finding just a few more CPU cycles to use for my program or, or to free eight bytes of RAM or to persevere through a dense map file to find a whole section of flash. Now, if you don't know where a map file comes from or how it's built, stick around, we'll get there. Before that, I want to show you how awesome they are and why it's worth digging to find them. Map files show you the memory layout of your system. They depend on your compiler, your linker, and processor. What I show you, unfortunately, won't be exactly what you see on your system. I want to give you things to look for, landmarks. I want you to have a map to your map file. And there are many ways, many different ways of looking at memory layout in your system. So let's look at my favorite a little more closely. On the left, you see how much of each type of memory we have. This is a simple system. We have just two types of memory, flash and RAM. And that sort of column is what you might see in a processor's data sheet. On the right is what I've put into the memory. I've drawn it so that I can see what's touching and I can see the ordering. My code, the constants, the global initializers, some memory to grow into, a little, little spot for a storage block, more like a database than a file system, someplace to keep my manufacturing data and security keys, serial number. And since I want to be able to change my firmware, I have a little fixed bootloader uh, to do that. And in the RAM, I have the actual globals, a heap for dynamic memory. Eh, I wouldn't really, but, and a stack. With an RTOS or an operating system, I'd have multiple heaps and stacks. I like looking at memory this way. It's worth sketching out, especially early in a design. It helps you make a plan about what things will be and what set expectations about how much code you can actually put into this system. But these are all really big sections. The bird's eye view, they don't let us dig into what we need when we get to the implementation stage. So why do we need a detailed map as we do development? Well, they can help with lots of different problems. My goal for this presentation is for you to know how to use the tools in a map file to solve the problems you face on your system. But we'll get back to these in more detail later. First, I want to walk through an actual map file. I want to look through an example program called Hello. This is for a TI chip. It can use BLE and Zigbee, and it was compiled with Code Composer Studio. It uses the TI RTOS called BIOS. It has a main that prints hello world and exits. There's a bit more going on here with the nits, and so that our system printf actually prints somewhere. And there's an operating system piece, the BIOS exit. It all looks simple, but it's an embedded si system, so it's never really as simple as it looks. I'm going to switch over to the map file now. Having someone else scroll through things would be tough for me. So if you want to scroll at your own speed, you can get these files from my website, Embedded FM. Let's look at the map file for a moment or two. It's a wall of hex. It's not nice looking. But reading some of it, memory configuration. So far, so good. Flash and RAM, we know what those are. GP RAM, sounds like RAM, has the same attributes as RAM. If we looked it up on Google, just searched the processor name and GP RAM, we'd discover it was a cache. But right now we don't care. We just want a bit of orientation with this map file. Segment allocation map. Not a good name. Better to think of it as a summary. Uh, and this is the flash. We know from that from the address. We, knew, we saw the address at the memory configuration, and now here it is. Uh, it has a bunch of different data segments, text, const, cnit, reset vex. We can guess these or Google them, though I'll warn you now that text means code, because that's important. 
And this is our RAM, again, based on the address. It, ha it also has different data segments. Data, heap, data again, stack, BSS. Heap and stack sort of make sense. We've heard those before. BSS and data may not, but we'll see a lot more of them. As I scroll down, these get broken into more and more detail, zooming in on different sections. Don't read everything. Mostly look at the left side of the screen with the sections. And wherever there is more white space, expect something to be a bit more interesting. So with the dot .bss and data, those are in RAM. For either one, if we looked at the symbols on the right and we had written this code, we might see a global variable name we recognize. On to text. These are going to be the function names. This is where your code really lives in the chip's flash. The first column is the start address, and the second is the length. Uh, so let's say you get a crash and your backtrace says it was at 0, 0, 0, 0, 0300. Looking here on line 157, we can see that it must be in the power sleep function. Scrolling down, well, this goes on for a long time. I wonder how many of these functions we don't need to run, how many bytes of flash we could get back if we needed them to do more useful work. Oh, something new. See, white space really does make this easier. Const, constants. For example, board GPIO init table. This sets up the GPIO, and it, marked, it was marked with a const keyword in the source file. Oh, look, module summary. This tells us which objects take up each type of memory. I feel like we've seen this information before. More stuff. Some seriously mangled names. Wow, I am less than a third of the way through this file. And now the symbols, RAM and flash, are sorted alphabetically. Good, sure, scroll faster. Okay, now, now they're sorted by address. It's the same information, really. It's repeated from other places in the file. There's a lot of stuff here, but you don't need to read the file from start to finish. It's not that kind of document. A map file is a reference book. It's more like an encyclopedia than a novel. That is step one to understanding map files. Use them, but don't read them. Don't get too bogged down in the details. Don't worry about all the things you don't know. Figure out what you need and go on. There's a lot of duplication in map files. It makes it handy to find some types of memory corruption, but it makes the files seem very long. Say I have a global variable that's being corrupted. Say it's uh, this one, parmbuff. What's around it? Well, here we have pin handle table. If it's writing beyond its memory, that might explain why parmbuff keeps getting corrupted. Walking through the files like this is probably not the best way to use a memory map. Usually I would just search for parmbuff until I found something worth investigating. But that was a very simple map file. Let's look at another one, very briefly. Hello was a little over 2,000 lines long. The next one's for a system that does a lot more. It's the same chip, but it interfaces with both BLE and Zigbee, and it's loaded by a bootloader, which is compiled separately, so we aren't gonna see that in the map file. The top looks similar. No, I'm not gonna go through that again. Let's just skip to the end. This one is 14,000 lines long. Let's look at another more interesting map file, one for an imaginary chip. It still has the memory configuration, as we saw before, and a summary. Those are in the middle now, instead of at the top of the file. The ordering of map files is often arbitrary. It depends on the build tools. But let's look at Ramlandia. Before we saw BSS and data, we've seen those a few times. We should always expect those. They are where our global variables go, and they are where our file statics and function statics go. Which is which? Well, globals and statics both go into BSS and data. It depends on how they're initialized. Anything with an initializer is in dot data. Anything with no initializer goes into BSS and gets zeroed out. 
When we look at the other RAM sections, we expect to see stack and heap. We should always expect to see stack, but if you don't see heap and you're in an embedded system, maybe you're not using dynamic memory by attention. Though sometimes heap is weirdly invisible. It's implied. It's everything after the end of listed RAM. Or sometimes the heap is called eSys or eSystem. There are a few things here on my map that you won't see directly in your project's map file, things that are a part of system memory. First, this ocean of unused address space. We only used a tiny fragment of the addresses there are. I mean, we only used 00, zero and 2000s. Even those we only used a tiny section of. But be careful not to put anything into the ocean. A dragon will get it and your system will probably crash. There is an address space you can use that isn't in your memory map. The port of peripheral registers. These are memory mapped hardware registers like timers, watchdog, spy, DMA, UART. All the registers you interact with that are hard coded in the address space. They don't show up in your map file directly. They're part of your processor manual. Now, across the memory configuration mountains, we have the Flash Federation. Most of that is taken up by code represented with dot .text. Why dot .text? Doesn't matter. You have forest of functions and orchard of functions with the mirror lake in between. That isn't really part of your usual memory itself. Functions go wherever they go, depending on your linker optimizer. But when we looked at the hello.map file, we saw the functions laid out in multiple ways, and I wanted to represent that here. The code section also has int vect or vector or reset vec. This is where the interrupt vector table is, sometimes at a fixed address, like the very start of flash or the very end. Sometimes it's not. It may be RAMVEC and over in RAMLandia. It should be somewhere though. And though we quite, don't quite know where and we don't know what it is called, we know it's there. Back to the top of Flash, we have initTopia. Here we have .cnit, which is the source of RAM's river of initialization. All those static and global variables that get initialized they have to have their initialization values stored somewhere in the flash. Those all get sorted out before your processor gets to main. It's part of your init process for C or C++. It's called C startup if you want to go look for more. C startup also copies RAM functions. Usually those are there for speed, maybe a few small functions that need to run really fast. Constantinia. Const is, well, what, they're constants things you mark with the const keywords, or strings that are hard-coded, magic numbers. And by marking them with the const keyword, they don't take up RAM, and they don't take up time during boot in order to get initialized. And I believe I've said not everything applies everywhere. RO data, read-only data, is where many compilers, including GCC, put variables marked with the const keyword. Sometimes you have const, sometimes you have RO data, sometimes both. And you may never see dot switch, which is used for lookup tables for switch expressions. The tables will still be built, but they'll get put into read-only data, unless there's a special situation, which we might want if we have a faster part of memory and a lot to look up. There are lots of little linker keywords like this that we usually ignore. You can learn more about these different data segments from the internet. It isn't critical to remember what each one does. They try to give hints in their names, except for BSS, which is block starting symbol, but really should be blank something something. In addition to the parts of the system you usually see, you may choose to allocate space to other things, like a storage system or file system or a bootloader. And depending on your optimization level and build system, you may see a list of discarded functions in your map file. That's where your linker file gets to show off how clever it is by showing you functions you shouldn't have bothered to write. Oh, and down here, 
you didn't think all memory map registers were documented, right? Now, clearly, I had a lot of fun building this, and you'll have access to it if you want. I hope it makes your map file a little bit more approachable. Now that we know what's in a map file, let's look at how to use it. We've seen the list of problems and some of the possible tools. Not every tool works for every problem. Let me go through these in a little bit more detail. Let's say you're out of code space. First thing to do is to look at the memory configuration and the summary. Does your summary match the expectations you have based on your processor data sheet? How much memory do you have and what kind? And the next step is to figure out where your memory is going. Looking at the more detailed information, the function lists. Are you short of RAM because you put a library into RAM functions? Is your code that large because you have a ton of constants? Maybe it's all those things you're printing out the debug port. Another question to ask yourself is whether there's a new problem. If so, what changed? If you suddenly run out of space, was it because someone used a particular function that caused a whole library to be included? Comparing files does mean you have to keep the old map files around or be able to easily rebuild them. I recommend releasing them with your binaries, but that's me. And while looking through the map files, we saw that the functions are ordered in different ways by name, address. They're often ordered by size as well. If your map file is an impenetrable wall of text, choose a non-static variable or function one you know is large, and search for it in the map file. Look around when you find it. What else is there? Is it interesting? If you're really hitting the wall, trying to find the last few bytes of RAM or code space, sometimes a visualizer can help. The idea is to make a viewer that looks sort of like this one, but with a lot more detail. I looked around for a commercial or open source tool to recommend to show you what one should look like, and I actually found very little of what I wanted. Long ago, I made an aux script to parse a map file into an HTML table that had cells proportional to the amount of memory used. It was for an old Kyle compiler at an 8051. Once you get accustomed to your map file output, you'll see it doesn't change format much. So scripting a visualizer isn't tough, and there is at least one Python library to help you. I've added some links and resources at the end. I didn't find any that I'd personally add to my tools list, but I do wanna show you what your visualizer output might look like. Trying to show an example visualizer is tough. Uh, they're usually interactive, so you can zoom in to see the function names. Note that all of the information here is in the map file. Once you make friends with the map file, you don't really need a visualizer. As you go about optimizing, look at the largest consumers first. Look at the things that take the most amount of space and reduce those. Shaving 10% off of 100 bytes is not as good as shaving 10% off of 1,000. And you may find that some unexpected libraries are included. You can trace through functions to see where they are called and find out why the libraries are included. Some libraries are monolithic, include any function in them and all of the libraries included. Others are granular, requiring only to load the required functions. Even the C standard library can be monolithic on some processors, so that using the built-in string copy function can lead to a larger footprint than you expect. Many times, you can write a function to replace the library. Other times you'll need to work out how to get around the limitation. Some examples to get the ideas flowing. Um, replace floating point with fixed point representation. It's always one of my favorites. Replace printf with a few functions that don't use variable arguments like log and log with num. Uh, replace string copy with your own implementation so you don't get the string library into your code at all or replace the abs function with a macro to remove floating point math library dependencies. You get the idea. However, I'm not suggesting you do these things until you know you have a problem. And when you do need to optimize, I'm a huge fan of tracking the changes you made and the results they had. 
it isn't always straightforward. If you have compile time or link time optimizations turned on, your attempts to reduce things may not go as you expect, at least not until you get the hang of it. Okay, let's talk about debugging the impossible bugs. Those icky crawly ones that you worry about but can't reliably reproduce. Hard faults are where the processor says, nope, you can't do that. Like if you try to write to null, which in my previous example was flash, and you can't just arbitrarily write to flash. You can get a hard fault when you jump to code that isn't in fact code. If you're fortunate, you have a debugging tool attached and you can get a backtrace and you can figure out where you were when things went horribly wrong. If you aren't lucky, there'll be some digging on your part. Maybe you, in your hard fault handler, you'll be able to log the return address, or maybe you'll be able to print it out somewhere before you reset. Then you'll need the map file to figure out where you were when the hard fault happened. And note, you'll need the map file of the version of the software you're running. So be careful about those versions. Even with a debugger and backtrace available, Having the map file open as you look at the stack and CPU registers might help you figure out where the code was when things went wrong. Note that searching directly for an address may not work because the map file lists the beginning of the functions. You need to look around to figure out where your address really is, what function is in this space. It's easy enough if your map file includes the functions listed in address order. The process is very similar with weird memory errors, which sometimes lead to hard faults and sometimes just lead to random results. If you have a global buffer that keeps getting corrupted, you can look at the memory map and see what's around it. Is UART buffer overflowing into ADC buffer? Finding corrupted memory near the end of segments is also interesting. This variable right at the top of the stack, it keeps getting mangled. Maybe I should look and see if my stack is overflowing. Figuring out exactly what you need to do isn't easy. There's still going to be a lot of trying to make it happen more often, trying to figure out how it crept in the code. What exactly is the voodoo to make it happen? General head scratching. But your map file gives you a few more tools and it might make it easier to use flash and RAM addresses to find your root causes. On to firmware update. As you plan out your system, think about how the memory should look. You need your bootloader here. You need a large space for the new version of code. You need the code. If you have an updatable library like Nordic soft devices, where do those go? Is your storage system where you keep your manufacturing data supposed to stay intact through this firmware update? Being able to sketch out a high-level memory map will help you figure out where all these things should go. Then the map file will show you where they actually are. And note, you may need multiple map files for this. Um, you, you have the new code, the old code, the bootloader, the soft device. These all have to agree as to where each one is supposed to be for firmware update to work. And finally, possibly inexplicably, the map file can show you how to make your code faster. First, if your code suddenly starts to get slow, a uh, diff with a good map file, what changed? It may be too small. Uh, it may be too small to see, so this doesn't always work. Diffing with your version control might work better. And yet, sometimes you can't see why fabs instead of abs make such a big difference until you see a giant library added into your map file to support floats. Next, look at your summary and look at your memory characteristics from your data sheet. Did you know that flash can have wait states so that even as your processor speed gets faster, your system doesn't? Every time you read from flash to run code or to read a constant, your CPU just waits for a cycle or six. By knowing how many wait states are in each type of memory, you have options for speeding up the execution by moving code to faster memory. 
For example, say you want to copy a critical function to zero wait state RAM, if that's faster than your normal program flash. For many optimization problems, if you're using one type of resource, like your CPU cycles, and you're running out, but you have another one available, like RAM, you can parlay that into a working solution. Finally, for using the map file to speed up your system, look at statistical sampling. Well, this is actually going to be a very brief explanation because statistical sampling is not this easy. Uh, a statistical sampling profiler runs an interrupt and stores the return address, thereby figuring out which functions you spend most of your time in. Of course, you need a pretty big RAM buffer and some extra code, and maybe you could do this with a JTAG programmer or a system debugger, especially one that has trace, but sometimes you can't. Sometimes you have to do it in the field. So once you get a dump of addresses of the functions that the timer interrupted, you can use the map file to figure out where you were. And I mentioned it's kind of hard, but if you need it, the possibility is there. And you'll definitely need a map file. So that's what you can do with a map file. And those are the tools you can use to do it. Oh, wait, we didn't use one of those. There, I fixed it. Let's look at another map file from a different compiler, GCC. Well, not really GCC. Behind GCC, there's a program called LD that does the actual linking. And that's what generates the map files we're about to look at. Before we get there, let's look at the pretty map again. It helps you find that amusing while I warn you about the graphic content you're about to see. GCC generated maps are not pretty. If you thought the one I was scrolling through earlier was a wall of hex and nonsense, close your eyes for the next bit. Also, not only are GCC maps tough to read, you have to ask for them specially from the linker. The one I'm going to show you is for Adafruit CircuitPython running on a Ceduino Zao, which has a microchip ATSAM D21, which is an ARM Cortex uh, M0+. It's a pretty complicated little system running a Python parser from a file system. OK, this starts with a list of files. Whee! And then a list of discarded things. You know, GCC, that was the most important thing to show me immediately when I started this file. Oh, hey, look, it's the memory configuration mountains. There they are. The forest of functions in dot text. This is the county of code. Oh, look, we're getting to Constantinia now. Oh, well, there's other stuff, stuff we didn't see before. But none of it's very big as we look at those lengths. So let's just skip it for now. Ooh, now we're on to Ramlandia. Oh, it's so sad. They have no RAM functions. I like RAM functions. All that data, it's, it's flowing across the river of initialization, both globals and static variables. And now for BSS and the lake of zeroing, still globals and statics. And there are the stacks. The stacks end at 2000, 2734. But the RAM from memory configuration goes to 2008,000. So we have about 5, 8 cc, eh, 22k left over. Remember that. OK, now we have some stuff that looks important, but who knows? Let's skip those and come back if we need them. Or maybe we'll Google arm.attributes and find out it has something to do with the arm itself. It's probably not something we want to mess with, so it's safe to ignore. Oh, look, GCC says we should load all of these object files. Yay dot comment, dot debug frame. Again, those don't look critical. They aren't huge, and we can Google them if we have to. But for most cases, ignoring things is OK, at least until you're out of other things to consider. I guess maybe GCC doesn't know that we can search through files, because here's a list of where every fu function is defined. I suppose this might be useful if we're getting a function from an unexpected library, but mostly snooze. And that's it. I mean, there was a lot of scrolling and ignoring, but we saw most of what we expected. 
although I didn't see heap hollows, did you? There's a reason for that, and it isn't because there's no dynamic memory. Let's look at the stack again, as the heap is usually nearby. Looking more closely at the stack part of the map file may give us some hints. The stack is 0e00 bytes. That's about 3,584 bytes. And as we look at it, there's some interesting stuff there. That load address, it's going to take the start of the stack. It's going to take the address where the start of the stack is, and it's going to put that in a flash address indicator. So our code will know where to get the stack from. But alas, there's no heap here. This is one of those cases where the heap is everything else. Stack ends at 2,002734. 2, Memory ends 22K later. And how do I know for sure that that's really being used as a heap? Well, on the command line during the build, it told me how many bytes I have used and how many I have free for stack and heap. And since I can see the heap here, I'm making an educated guess. If my job depended on this, I'd malloc something and look at the address, verify it was in the, verify it was in the address range I expected. At the beginning, I promised to tell you a little bit more about where map files come from. And I've mentioned the linker. How does the linker know where to put all of the consts and, and statics and globals? How does it know what goes into flash and what goes into RAM? Well, there's a linker file. It usually ends with .cmd or .mk. And explaining them would be a whole nother talk. So I've got some resources at the end. You can go read about it in many excellent blogs. But let me show you a little taste of what the linker file looks like. Here I'm going to compare the hello example link file with its map file. You can see that they're definitely siblings. According to its man page, the GNU linker LD accepts linker command language files written in a superset of AT&T's link editor command language syntax. So in order for you to build your code, an unknown program accepts bizarre files in an archaic language. I'm beginning to think this may be more about wizardry and incantation than pirates. Looking more at this linker file, you can see how it answers some of the questions we had. Why is our flash organized like this? Why do some parts of the code go into flash and other parts into RAM? Because that's what the linker file told the linker to do. Linker files are very important, especially if you're allocating specific sections for storage, or you have a bootloader, or the ability to switch between images. Still, map files are way more interesting. The linker files are the directions. The map files are where you've actually been. And now that you know what to look for as you scale the memory configuration mountains and look at Summary Valley, I hope I've given you another tool, a tool to make embedded software a little easier to develop. Thank you for being here. I am Alicia White. If you would like the map file for yourself or a copy of this presentation, check out embedded.fm under map files. If you have enjoyed this presentation, you may also enjoy our weekly podcast where we talk to people about the how and why of their system. And feel free to buy my book. It's a lot like this presentation in that it isn't very code heavy and it isn't about a specific processor. It tries to give you a framework of what to expect when you're making embedded systems. And if you'd like to contact me, there's a contact link on Embedded FM or on logicalelegance.com, which is my consulting company.